Deuteronomy 1. Then, as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. <clears throat> and so we reached Kadesh Barnea. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up, take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors told you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkol and explored it. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say, the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes <clears throat> and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God, who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, no one from this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, you shall not enter it either, but your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him, because he will lead Israel to inherit it. And the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around, set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Then you replied, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight as the Lord our God commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it easy to go up into the hill country. But the Lord said to me, tell them, do not go up and fight, because I will not be with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. So I told you, but you would not listen. You rebelled against the Lord's command, and in your arrogance, you marched up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in those hills came out against you. They chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down from Seir all the way to Horma. You came back and wept before the Lord, but he paid no attention to your weeping and turned a deaf ear to you. So you stayed in Kadesh many days, all the time you spent there. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sue. Uh, would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, uh, we heard Moses say today here that you are the one who would go ahead and fight for us, and you are the one who carries us. And we pray that in the midst of whatever it is we might sense that you are calling us to do, that we would know that that is true for us today, that you are the same, that we need not be afraid. So guide us as we consider this passage in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So here's the thing, and this is what we ought to think about mostly this morning, this idea of living as followers of Jesus in the midst of the nations uh, proves to be anything but easy. That's simply the way it is. Um, if you were standing in that Israelite community on the plains of Moab listening to Moses speak on that day so long ago, you would be looking across the border into the promised land, listening to Moses and realizing that this will not be easy. It will not be easy. Moses calling to mind the fact that the Israelites have been here in this place about ready to go in a little bit different location. They're a little bit farther to the south and west. But they've been at this point, at this moment, about to enter the promised land before. The Israelites have been there before, and things did not go well. They were on the brink of entering the promised land. They send a few spies in to check it out, to see what they will encounter, maybe to figure out the best route that they would to take. And they come back and they report to the community. They say, it is a really good land. It is unbelievable. This is prime real estate. The grapes, the pomegranates, the figs. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's wonderful, but we will not go in. We will not go in. Because it was going to be tough. And there were elements of going into the promised land and what they were going to face that terrified them. And they said, it's a good land, but we will not go in. And there's a question that comes through this to the Israelites as they stood on the plains of Moab, ready to go in for the second time now. And it's a question that keeps coming to us today. And the question goes something like this. You, you trust that God, you trust God to deliver on his promises to you, don't you? You do. You trust God to deliver on his promises to you, don't you? You do. There's two things that we need to affirm from this passage as they stand on the plains of Moab, thinking about where they're going to go and knowing that it will not be easy, the first thing that comes through clearly is that God really does have good things in store for his people. God really does. God really does. This is not at question in the text. The land is a good land. This is not second-rate land. This is not one of those experiences where you're thinking about traveling somewhere, you're thinking about buying a house, and you look at the pictures online, and you think, ooh, this is really good, and then you get there, and you say, what, what happened? The, the pictures suggested something else. The reality is, well, it's a bit underwhelming. What happened? This isn't that case. The spies go in, they're told it's going to be a good land, and they come back, and they say, it's a good land. It's a good land. God really does have good things in store for his people. I don't have to belabor the point or even make the point that people call this into question, that people would wonder if God has good things in store for them. God, God doesn't really, right? I mean, this is, this is Genesis 3 all over again. When the serpent comes to Eve and to Adam, it says, what do you think? Uh, you think really God has it well intended for you? He doesn't want you to eat from that tree so that you don't have the same kind of knowledge as God does. God doesn't want you to have that so that you won't be like God. See, see God doesn't really have your best interest in mind. That's that's been the subtle little line all along. God doesn't really care for you. God won't really actually do well by you. Maybe we think about what some people might say about, well, how does Scripture call us to live? If you read Moses, if you read the prophets, if you read Jesus, if you read Paul, look at what they say you can't do. You can't do a lot of things. And some people would say, see, the, no fun. <laughs> I'm going to try things my own way. I'm going to make a life for myself. I'll see what I can come up with. But Moses is affirming here, God really does have good things in store for his people. God's promises are really good 
They're really good. Think of Peter writing to Christians in a context of suffering or about to be suffering. And he starts his letter by saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his great mercy has given us living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we've been given birth into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And it's kept in heaven for you. You who are sealed by the power of God until that day. It's stunning. And what do the promises include? Resurrection. A new heavens and a new earth where there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. It's, all, it's, all, it's your inheritance. God really does have good things in store for his people. And the second thing that comes through is that God can and should be trusted. God can and should be trusted to make good on his promises. This is where that Israelite community, 38 years prior to this moment in Deuteronomy, standing in Kardash Barnea, this is where they fail. This is where they lose their nerve. This is where they say, I, I don't think so. The spies go in, and while it's a good land, they discover there's people there with cities built with huge walls that can't be penetrated, and the Anakites live there. You're supposed to gasp. Let's try that again. The Anakites live there. <gasps> Yeah, that's what they would have done. The Anakites were the big people, the strong people, more machine-like than human-like. They were like warriors. They lived there. And the spies saw the Anakites and the cities they had built. And they said, it's a good land, not a chance. Actually, the Lord has brought us here to be destroyed. That was God's purposes all along. See, the Lord hates us. And Moses said, no, 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 hang on. The Lord, the one who brought you out of Egypt and fought for you there, will go before you and will fight for you in this new good place. The Lord will do it. And remember, the Lord who carried you through the wilderness who carried you the way a father carries his son, the Lord will carry you and will care for you in this new good place. And the Israelites, save for Caleb and Joshua, said, not a chance. Not going in. You trust God to deliver on his promises to you, don't you? You do. Sometimes we need encouragement with this. Monday night, we're in council. We're talking through uh, the book of Mark a little bit in council this year together. And, and we landed on the passage you know well. It's a scene you know well. Jesus with his disciples out on the lake. They're in a boat. The storm comes up. It's like Dorian, and this boat is about to go under. And the disciples are freaking out. And Jesus is sleeping. <laughs> And the disciples go to Jesus and say, Lord, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we are destroyed? And Jesus wakes up and he gets up and he says, quiet, and the sea is still. And he says, where's your faith? And we said, it kind of feels like a mean jab, that question. What do you mean, where is your faith? Those waves looked like the Anakites. Jesus says, where's your faith? He's not looking for an explanation. He's not looking for us to rationalize why we're afraid. He's wondering why we're not looking at him. He's wondering, kind of like the Israelites not looking at what God had done, why, why are we focused on the threat rather than on God? That's what Moses is doing here. Yeah, there's Anakites. They're big, they're powerful, they're scary. You remember who fought for you? Remember who carried you. You trust God to deliver on his promises to you. Don't you? A message like this feels a bit like telling our children over the years that I wish I could guarantee that the house will not burn down, that the plane will not crash, 
that no bad things will happen. I wish I could guarantee all of that. But I can't. I can't. Here's Moses. The place where you are going is a good place. But it will not be easy. It will not be easy. But you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Because God who fought for you and who carried you will fight for you and will carry you. You don't have to be afraid. I said the message of this, ti- uh, of this uh, the title of this message, I, I put no easy assurance. There's assurance here, but it's not easy assurance. There's something that we might think about too in terms of maybe it's Maybe there's odd assurance in here. Who who of you wants to be able to know that you are on the path to the place that you really want to go? We like being in that spot, right? I I want to go there. I I, I need to know that I'm on the right path. We all want to get there. We all want to land in the destination of God's promise where all is while we all want to get there. And here's the consistent message over and over again through scripture, the way from here to there will not be easy. But maybe one of the indicators that we're on the right path is that we find that it isn't easy. Maybe when we find ourselves staring into a new situation, wondering how are we going to endure that, how will we make it through, and we step into it, maybe there's some assurance. I I don't know how God is going to work through this. I don't know why God would have me on this path to get there, but the path isn't easy. Just like Jesus said it wouldn't be. And maybe there's an odd sort of assurance that comes through that, that assures us that indeed we're, we're on the right path, even though it's the hard path. Yesterday, um, Lena and I were in Grand Rapids, and we listened to this gentleman. Um, I'm going to try to have you say his name with me. Bunga Shibaku Kato. Can you say that? Bunga Shibaku Kato. Um, Bunga Shibatu is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, he's a professor. He's a pastor. He's a saint. He would say he's our brother. He's consulted for really difficult political issues. He's known suffering and hardship. He's lived through the civil war in the Congo. He's fled his country. He studied in, the, in South Africa. He, he completed his studies. He was waiting to sign a contract to stay there and teach. He was going to sign it the next morning, the night before he was going to sign it. He said, God spoke to me. He said he saw a dark spot. And he said, what is that? And God said, that's your country. And then he saw a bright light. And the long and short of it was, he was to be the bright light reflecting the light of Jesus Christ in the midst of his very dark country. And he said, okay, God, I will go. And he didn't sign the contract. And he went back into the Congo where there's been a gun held against his head, where he has told his wife, I feel like I might be dying. But he basically said to her, but don't don't feel sorry for yourself because there are thousands of other widows in our country. He's been imprisoned. And those are his words in the midst of it. My treasure is joy, satisfaction, peace. The room was like silent, (laughs) kind of as it is now. 
Who is this guy? What does he know? What does he trust? I think he knows this. God really does have good things in store for his people. And God can and should be trusted. Come what may. Rowan Williams, the former uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Church of England, he's got this nice little book. He says, the gathering of baptized people is not a convocation of those who are privileged, elite, and separate. But it's a gathering of those who have accepted what it means to be in the heart of a needy, contaminated, messy world. This is us. This is us. Jesus, the light of the world, who shone in the midst of the darkness, and John says, and the darkness could not overcome it. Crucified, but risen. Jesus now sends us into the world saying, you're the light of it. It will not be easy, but I am with you. And God, the one who has really good things in store for you, can and should be trusted. You trust God to deliver on his promises to you, don't you? I know you do. But sometimes we need encouragement. Because sometimes the Lord brings us to a place or to a situation and we look at it and we say, I don't know. That looks hard. Kind of feel like the descendants of the Anakites over there. I don't know if I can go in. Moses doesn't really leave the people with an option. They need to go in. Jesus knew that he didn't have an option. He was called to go forward. Jesus calls us, and he says, follow me. I'll be with you. So I don't know what the Lord would have you do, what the Lord would have you say, where the Lord is leading you, what the Lord might be asking you to leave. I don't know that. I simply know that if the Lord leads you to say or do something or to go somewhere or to leave something behind, it's good for us to do what the Lord says. Maybe quite certain that it won't be easy, but fully confident in the fact that God really does have good things in store for us and God can and should be trusted. I'm going to invite the worship team forward at this time. Our song of response is really a prayer. It's a prayer that acknowledges the challenges that come along with being the people of God who live in the midst of the nations. And it's a prayer that says, oh God, through your spirit, would you lead me out on the waters with you to a place where there is no boundary around my trust because I trust in you, the one who will not and who cannot fail. Would you stand and sing this?